this is episode two of the Tech for Good podcast. We're recording this on the 8th of June 2016 and it's really, really warm in here. We're a collection of people who all work in a Tech for Good sector. Some of us were once in radio and wanted to carry on the dream. If we stick on topic, we should be talking about things like dogs taking payments, Snapchat for charities, the sharing economy and political bias on news feeds alongside some other stuff. With me today are our regulars. They can count as regulars now, right? We've done two podcasts. They are Ben, this one time in South America, White. Good evening. Researcher, strategist, and ex Tinder Z list celebrity, Greg Ashton. Hi, everyone. User experience advocate and musical genius, Johnny Evans. Hello. Editor, producer, and someone with a surname I can't say, Paul Jakubowski. And me, Bex. So, how do you say your name, Paul? Uh, there's, there's many ways you can say it. I'm fine with that one. That's Jakub- not how names Jakubowski. work. Jakubowski. It's Jakubowski. Jakubowski. Mr. Bowski. Well, it's, it's a whole Polish thing. Banter. But I just like to put but in a way that you can It people must have spell. a pronunciation, though. Names, like, that's not how names work. It must yeah, it have does. a definitive way it. of saying it. It's fine. It's why I don't invite you to events, because I can't type his name into my calendar. It's not that hard. It's easy. Say it one more time. Say it, say it one more time. Well, I say Jakubowski, just to make, make it easy, but Jakubowski. 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 That's what I'm going to call for now. No ball, just Jakubowski. So our stat of the month, Greg. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just doing a quick recap on our stat that wasn't a stat, it was a, a, a report and a, a study that had been done on cancer being caused by mobile phones. In the period between the last podcast and this podcast, somebody else has come out in America with a very expensive $25 million um, study which has basically said that um, cell phones do cause cancer. Um, there's a big issue with this study though, and I don't feel too bad about what we said last month in that. Um, Dr. Otis Brawley from the American Cancer Society's chief medical officer basically said if off the back of this report, if cell phones cause cancer, they don't cause a lot of cancer. <laughs> he also goes into other um, extensive um, study of the, the actual report, which basically rips it to shreds um, and points out the fact that it was a complete waste of money. Um, so moving on to the stat of the week for this week, um, quite an interesting study, quite uh, topical for us here, um, is the amount of cash that people have in their pockets. Um, and the study has shown that 15% of 25 to 35 year olds carry no cash whatsoever. Ever. What's, well, I don't know whether it's ever. But you read the report, Greg. Yeah. During this, yes, but I mean, it's quite reductive in that during this study, they're asked, do you carry cash? I'm fairly certain that people probably don't think, have I ever carried cash? Um, but for this study, they responded, do you carry cash? And uh, 15% of 25 to 35 year olds said they don't carry any cash. I won't I go don't. into details, yeah, but some of us here are 25 to 35. Let's just say we all are, hey? <laughs> uh, who carries cash here? No, I carry receipts now instead of cash. But you don't and carry cash. I occasionally wake up and think, oh, I've got some, oh no, it's a receipt. You don't carry cash though because you don't need to because we'll go to a restaurant or a bar and then you'll mysteriously leave before the bill comes. <laughs> there's no, there's no mystery wallet. about that, yeah. Jenny. It's a very clear process for me. Yeah, I don't carry cash. That's when they sting you at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not how uh, paying for goods works. But yeah, I. It's my dream not to even have need a wallet. I bought a really small, low-profile wallet, so it was small in my pocket. It was a waste of money because money doesn't fit in it, which is the most first-world problem ever. But I have to screw the money up into like a tiny little tube to fit it into this non-wallet so I don't carry money. I want to be able to pay for everything with my phone. Yeah, it is annoying that when you have to buy bus passes and they ha- you have to have cash, yeah. and you have to before you get on the bus, you've got to go to the cash machine. Mm. How many people now get insanely annoyed by having to use chip and pin instead of contact? Yeah, I've forgotten. Yeah. I've forgotten my pin. We, pin. Yeah. Why did he ask you? Is contactless okay? <laughs> Every time. Of course, it's okay. okay. No. It's the best thing ever. I, I really enjoy the whole contactless thing. 
And my girlfriend's sort of terrified of the fact someone might be able to steal to twenty pounds in interaction. <laughs> could be Is that right? 30, uh, 30, transaction, 30, sorry. 30. Which I I don't know. I mean, I guess you really could if you found someone's contactless card. Yeah. Kind of spend quite a lot of money on it. Yeah, what apparently there's a case? limit per day, but yeah. I've used contactless a lot mm. in a day. I, and I've not... reached it quite a few times. Oh, what's the limit? So we hang around the Northern Quarter. But, uh, <laughs> Could you yeah, give I don't me know an approximation of that, Paul? Yeah, what's the... No, well, I didn't really want to ask bar staff about how banks work. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they said, oh, it happens all the time if you use it too many, too frequently, like within an hour or something like that. Someone just assumes that it's been stolen. Um, but again, Ben doesn't have that problem Yeah, <laughs> bars and restaurants. Anyway, tax for good. What does this mean for tax for good, that young people are not carrying cash anymore? Well, one of, one of the things that I've heard a lot is that, oh, well, we make most of our money, certainly from some smaller charities, hospices, people like that, where they say, um, we get most of our don donations from cash, we're not going to do anything clever because what's the point, people aren't interested in it. Um, but I've read around this topic and um, different people reporting on... on um, the, this information and one of the best things I read was it's the cause not the technology so whether it's physical cash whether it's an online donation whether it's a kind of contactless payment people don't fess up money because they it make it's much easier because they can reach in the pocket and pull out some change people do it because they like the cause um, and that whole thing about you know having a, a money box at tills and stuff like that you know, there's been loads of apps that have come out this year where you can donate an extra penny every time you buy something. And I think it is. People have, charities have this whole thing where they're like, oh, people won't buy into it. Yet we're all going out and spending tons and tons of money on contactless every single yeah. day. Yeah, well, it's almost the opposite problem for me now. My mum recently did a thing where she did a dragon boat race for her hospice um, that she works for and I turned up on the day to support her. I was like, how can I give you money, mum? And she gave me this printed out form. I was like, I've got no cash on me. Send me the Just Giving link. She was like, what? Mm -hmm. Like, send me the Just Giving link. She's like, what? Mm -hmm. oh, right, well, I can't give you any money. And I literally didn't give any money to my mum, <laughs> my mum's fundraising campaign because I didn't have any cash with me and she didn't have a digital way of me giving her money. Two, so it's two points, one. <laughs> Were the boats shaped like dragons? They had dragon heads on the front. Okay, awesome. Secondly, people tend to give, am I right thinking that people will spend more donating digitally than they will with actual cash as well? That's what that study kind of showed, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I think contactless is such a frictionless form of payment. Yeah. If you're saying cash is easy, contactless is probably even easier. Not even frictionless, I'd say. And this is good for charities, I guess. Um, you're more likely to be less cautious, I think, mm. with your money as well. You know, I guess where, if let's say you've got, you actually using cash, which people tend not to do now based on this study, you've got 20 pounds in your wallet, and if you if you don't take your card out with you, you're gonna be yeah, probably yeah. more responsible with that 20 pound, right? Yeah. Because with the card, you're not really seeing the money, you're not getting a report. Greg and I were talking about um, some kind of new card. I recently got a Mondo card where you pay with the card and immediately you get a notification on your app how much money is left in your account. This kind of giving you more information of what you're spending. Whereas if you're just using contactless, it's so easy just to go out, spend, 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 have absolutely no idea how much money you're spending, which is good in a sense for charities with a donation because maybe you're more likely to spend more because it doesn't feel like real money. But then way. charities need to like make the most of this then and have the yeah. option mm. for people to do this. And it goes back to that thing about it being the cause, not the technology. Yeah, and it leads on to our campaign of the month, which is Pat and Tap, contactless donations through dogs. Greg, is that right? Through yeah. dogs? Through dogs. Dogs, as yeah. in the animals. Yeah. I'm very excited about this. <laughs> Wait, what other dogs do you think it could have been? No, I'm just like, this some kind of <laughs> dog. I, I've just seen a line now on this, on this piece of thing that says dogs taking payments. I'm extremely excited about some kind of way of using dogs in charity. Yeah, so yeah, the, the, it's free work, isn't it? They don't have to pay the dogs. Um, but no, this is slave army of yeah, dogs. Slave now army I'm less dogs. on board with it. <laughs> really? Yeah, it feels. I bad. very much doubt that they were slave army. Uh, this is Blue Cross, who are an animal charity, and um, they basically uh, gave a bunch of dogs these coats, which had a contactless payment thing and a nice little mm. um, bit of information on saying, you know, if you tap your contact contactless card here, you'll make this amount of a donation. 
Um, which is perfect because to we are... To the dog. To, well, to Blue Cross, <laughs> but to the dog. It's a dog. To, yeah. It's a dog this, did this really happen? Yeah. Or is this like a pretend it's like viral thing that's not real? Maverick the Border Collie, Cherry the Lurcher, Ralph the Old English Sheepdog Cross, and uh, Labrador's Rosie and Smudge. So you could put your cash card up against this dog and make a payment? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is, I suppose, a little bit like, you know, you get those Labrador dog money jars yeah. in supermarkets. Looks I don't know like if I remember that. Yes. And they always get stolen by some kids mm. yeah. that have it in Sorry their garden. Not where I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> I only did that twice. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're, I mean, they've, they've gone, people are doing this. People love dogs. Mm. People love, and the, it's that whole pat and tap, like loads of people <laughs> love to walk past the dog and stroke it. And if, if you think of this idea, this sounds like something yeah. you would dream up. Is this your doing? Well, I wish it was. It's it's in the list of things I wish I'd come so up. So how with. how do you know? Um, so sorry to interrupt you. So did the whole we're going to use the term pat and tap? That's a thing now. Um, how do you know? I'm trying to imagine the scene where that money's going uh, with the dog. Is there someone with the dog and like is it explaining what it is? No, they literally just, just send the dogs, dogs out. <laughs> <laughs> imagine them, like stray, an army of stray dogs. Yeah. They're trying to jump in your, your pockets, pocket. basically. Yeah. Dogpocalypse, where they're all just sat there looking at you, waiting for you yeah. to get drunk and then come yeah, over. Just trying to hold your eye, watch above right. your head. It's habits in those eyes. Uh, so no, how, they, how does it work? Do yeah, you? obviously someone's you know taking it around and they can explain the situation. People might see. They've got a little coat on. They've with got the a coat on with in information it. about it, and it's very much Look the how same. Look how happy Bex is. There's no cameras here. <laughs> Bex is going to go out and find a dog straight after this and pay money. Instinctively, you're tapping the desk. Yeah. Please. <laughs> but yeah, that's an awesome. I mean, it's it is beautifully manipulative. I just that's an amazing them. idea. They've got like they've really gone to town on the puns as well. They're called tap dogs. You know, instead of like top dogs, they've got loads of stuff in, in this article the, about that's it. That's the best pun. Yeah. That was like an attack. Yeah. I think you, I had you not explained it was top dog, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah that, that was a top you can also, you're a tap dancing dog. Yeah. You can also lend a paw to raise money for sick and homeless That's blue rubbish. rubbish pet. <laughs> <laughs> you missed the, I mean, the scheme is genius, but the punning is, literally give us five minutes. I think someone's written one down. Tap cats? Cat. Top cats? Cat. Yeah. yeah. Tap cats. You, yeah, but you cannot make a cat do anything. No. Yeah. Like, I love cats, but they're soulless monsters. You could definitely make my cat wear the coat and then spend the next day trying to get it off her head. Taps would, cl cost me cats that would fortune. claw in your yeah. card and take it to yeah. like, buy drugs. Interestingly, That's what would happen. here's a fact from my dad, Dave. Um, <laughs> if, Dave. If your dog kills someone, you're liable for that death. But if your cat kills someone, it's the cat's fault because they're um, legally recognised as free spirits. Yeah, that's why we've got a cat prison. But that's, that's why if you run a cat over, you're not, you don't have to report it. Um, I think you did. So do they're you trying not? to change this law? No. Really? If you do, yeah. How is that a law? Thank no, you don't. You don't. This has You can join in. Tap cats for treats and charity. Gamification. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's worth explaining this. We, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we have some guests in the studio today. Just um, who are too shy to talk. <laughs> Right, well, they don't have they don't have microphones to be fair yeah, so. yeah that's, that's fair. so we're not allowed them to talk <laughs> no the right way censorship oh, legally censorship tech for good so last time we talked about snapchat quite a lot and we've got some more facts about snapchat this time as well yeah um coming in with some stats at you um so bex has been really caught up with um snapchat filters been really eager on well it. It was because I, I read that um, Crunchy spent half of the digital budget on Snapchat filters. Really? They didn't set up a Snapchat channel or whatever you call it. They just did a filter and paid for it. And that's half of their digital budget for the year. That's massive, a massive amount of money. Crunchy Cadbury's though. Crunchy, yeah. Are yeah, yeah. Cadbury's are idiots. <laughs> well, they, they, it, it did well. Yeah, and a lot of people are picking up on this. So in the recent KPCB Internet Trends Report for 2016, um, they talk Love about the report. success of brand filters and geo filters. Um, and uh, World AIDS Day um, did one in America, which had 76 million views, well, above that apparently. Um, but the great thing about this was, was each time a geo filter was sent, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation donated three pounds to Red's fight against AIDS. Oh. And there was um, above 90% higher likelihood of donating amongst those who saw the geo filter. So it's not just a case of, oh, it's a fun, silly thing. People, you know, it's actually making a difference. That's, have you got the kind of final totals for that as yet? 
Uh, it's not in this report, but it'd be interesting to look into that further. That. Yeah. So um, that's kind of amazing. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of reports about uh, younger audiences. Snapchat is massive amongst younger audiences, but there's loads of reports about these younger audiences being more engaged with charity, more open to um, giving both their time and money towards charities. So there's an audience there, and it's a massive audience mm. now. It's growing every day. So I think it'd be really, you know, it's one of these things that Bex is really keen on us being involved in and other charities being involved in and bringing it into the UK because a lot of this information from Snapchat is happening in America, so. Your speakers are amazing. Impressive. Good figures. Good figures. We like good data. It, does anybody actually use Snapchat? I, I try to. I, I think I'm too old for it, but yeah. it just it makes very little sense to me. I love it being like a beautiful mystery that every now and again someone shows me something and <laughs> it's just like rainbows shooting out of their ears. and. <laughs> Like, look at this, I've done the something something with the something else. I'm like, that's amazing, guys. I think that's why I'm pretty obsessed with it and keep going on about it, because it seems to be working um, and lots of people are using it, but I don't no. get it. Uh, so yeah. it's like a magical mystery yeah, for me. Yeah, it is that. But I like it all the more for that, I think. The filters are technically really impressive. I think the people who I know don't use it very well, so I have cousins who send me photos of like them, or, like an older relative who I don't really care about. She's not on Twitter, she won't hear this. Um, <laughs> so they send me like a photo of them having tea, but then the photo disappears after a few seconds and I can never see it again. So that's poor Snapchatting, I guess, because they should just mm. send me that via like, WhatsApp so I can see it forever. Um, you can have conversations on Snapchat, yeah. but they disappear. Yeah. So you can be chatting away to somebody like you would on a text message, you know, old school, maybe mm. email. Um, but on Snapchat, it disappears. And but what's the Snapchat story? So does anyone know what Snapchat is? That's, all, that's the only yeah. thing I really know. Panorama what to do. have done Snapchat stories. So I think they won an word. award oh, for that so one. Old, yeah. Yeah. Tell, someone explain to me how Snapchat stories work. Well, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a story, so you can make like a, a story. Or photo based. Well, no, it's not just yeah, photo based. You can mel, you can mel kind of video with. Um, little bits of anim like uh, you can do filters and different things on Snapchat. You can throw in like figures and times and stuff like that. So you can mix between video and stills um, and make these stories on there, which are just yeah, fantastic. All that's in my story, I've not I've not got the creativity of it. It's just I go, oh here's a new filter. I'll try it on my face. Oh that looks cool. I'll put it in my story. So my story is just five pictures of my face. I don't really know if I'm using it right. This is my problem with Snapchat. I don't like most people uh, or their faces. So why would I want to communicate with it's people's faces? It's a very faces? people stroke face-based technology. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> that's something that charities could use. So that kind of, do any charities use stories effectively in that way that we know of? No. No. And a lot of brands though aren't really having their own story. Okay. Because um, I don't know if there's much of a story in it. Uh, I don't know if people really read stories that much. It's more yeah. about the communication and try and the getting other pe getting people to use your filter, which spreads your awareness of your whatever you're doing. Okay. Um, I've thought of loads of applications for this. I'm not going to give any away because I might uh, use them. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's cool. I like it. Yeah. So should we move on to tech news of the month? Yeah. Our first one is net use and the Uber 75s. Um, what does this report say, Greg? I'm really interested in this. Um, so this goes back to the whole discussion that we were having before about, oh, should we be using contactless payments because maybe our donor um, demographic is much older and they won't understand how to use their cards because you know, cards are a really new thing and they don't really understand that stuff. And it's, it's a common one, but there's always this misconception where um, there's a belief that people who are older don't understand technology. Um, and almost two thirds of people aged over 75 have never gone online, but that numbers are growing um, massively. And I think the biggest thing is that technology has changed. So the introduction of um, tablet technology, touch technology mm -hmm. is making a difference for people. Um, and there's a lot of studies and research being done that shows that Although they might be not as tech savvy as younger audiences, they they are picking up things much, much quicker than they were before when it was just like laptops and desktop PCs. Yeah, my uh, nan was liking all my Instagram pictures before, which was a very strange thing to happen to me. So why do you think they're picking it up? Is it, do you think that actually um, products or services are actually engaging that generation more? 
Is that why we think that's happening? Well, it's an aging population anyway. Yeah. So people who are getting older can already use technology anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's just a not fair to say that people can't use technology at, at that age because yeah. they, they can. And there's... Um, I've been working with somebody recently who has done studies in working with, with older people on technology and, and her stance on it is that actually loads of people have, um, they, they, they spend more on technology than we do. Mm. You know, the, we all know about silver servers. This has been going on for years and years and years. We talked about that so much. They all, you know, spend a lot of money on uh, holidays. They all put the holidays online. You know, it, it, othering old people on the web is, is just silly. I think it's just an easy thing to say, isn't it? Oh, well, they just don't understand it. They don't understand it. Mm. But, I mean, uh, net use among women aged 75 and over has grown by 169% since 2011. Um, and I've, I've seen it personally, like with my parents, who were complete technophobes as far as computers were, were viewed. But now they Skype. My sister's in Australia. My mum and dad are on uh, Facebook all the time. Um, my dad uses mobile to access information about Man United. He's got like loads of apps on his phone. He constantly goes on and buys ridiculous things from Amazon and they turn up at home and he's like, oh, I don't know why that's turned up. That. <laughs> and my mum's like, you, you're lying. <laughs> and he's like, no. And then he looks at me and gives me a wink and it's like ridiculously horrendous t-shirts that he just thought, oh, I'll buy that late at like night. Like three wolf moon. Yeah, three. I, I'm pretty sure he did buy a three more for wolf moon. Wolf moon. <laughs> <Wolf food. laughs> that one as well. Yeah. But from a purely commercial sense, it's a massive market share, though, that aging population still. And it is, I think, there are still, whilst it is a myth, isn't it, that they won't use digital services, there, is, there are still, as people get older, accessibility needs. And it's a case of making sure that the things that we make are taking care of that. Like my dad, for example, uses Siri massively because he bypassed that whole generation of where you're on computers or you're on phones. So the whole thing of like keyboard inputs is beyond him really, but talking to people is what felt natural to him. Um, I can guess, I have no basis for this, but it's probably kind of like sections of really narrow but deep usage. So when, I'm trying to think, when the internet first came out, let's say that, <laughs> it was just, you know, a baffling thing for mum and dad. But then there's been certain applications that they've really, really found useful. Skype was one of them. Mm -hmm. While I was living away, like they were, you know, using Skype all the time, because once you kind of mastered it... Where did you live, Ben? There's no need to get into that, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> was it somewhere south? I heard a it? rumor that Ben may have lived in Buenos Aires oh. at some point. It doesn't come up in every conversation. It doesn't ever. sound like something You laid a trap for me then, didn't you? You, just, yeah, you, you had this whole section. The whole section. When I was hiking in the hills of Buenos yeah. Aires. So let's, let's use a different example. Like, my dad has nailed the flight schedules for Ryanair, EasyJet, and whichever the cheap airlines exist. And they are terrible websites. Yeah. So but he knows exactly when the new fares are going to be issued. He is straight on there, the day that they are, and kind of like making the bookings. So when you've got a real purpose, a real reason to use it, then the kind of, the, the, the fact this technology falls away, and it's got like a real meaning for you. Yeah, and as you were saying though, accessibility is so important. Uh, another example of this is when my granddad first used his first smartphone, he couldn't um, use he couldn't type on it because he it's something that happened to his hand and it all seized up and mm. he couldn't use it anymore. Mm. Um, but he wrote he wrote notes and photographed them and sent them his messages. Aww, that was his nice idea thing. of text messaging. Yeah, my dad doesn't have anything wrong with his hands. He's got, just got the hugest thumbs in the world. So obviously he's got like, a tiny <laughs> <little> smartphone, <laughs> he can't press them. So he loves like the voice activation and yeah. stuff. So. so that's it. So there's um, the, old, the more mature generation, to respectfully call them, have real use for digital. Maybe more so than others, I guess, if uh, maybe actually getting out and about is more difficult. Yeah. So it's a case of removing those barriers. Uh, they probably just them. like piss around in it a lot less. So they're kind of using it for specific purposes. That's how I always feel like a little bit embarrassed by my parents, my aunties and stuff, because they use the internet for what they need it for. They use the technology for what they need it for. Then they switch it off and go and have a chat with someone. I think that's kind of a nice balance that I would like to achieve more oh, in my life. My granddad locks himself in the shed and watch, lo watches a load of YouTube videos. That's like Aww. what he does nowadays. <laughs> so there's a yin and a yang is what we're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess that's a really important point you were making, Johnny, about actually this could be massive for them. Mm. If we make things accessible for the older generation, especially ones that might you know, be uh, very lonely, not have many people to speak to anymore, this could be a really, really important thing for them. Tesco shopping, mm. um, if people can't get around as much mm. as they used to or go and carry loads of shops from, from te Tesco, they can get it delivered to the house. This could be really enabling for the yeah. older generation if we get it right. Yeah. 
massive cup because we say that there's the I think unfounded mock of the younger generation that they just sit on their ass all day, don't do anything in front of the tablet, in front of the computer. Right? <laughs> that sounds and like that, a teenager. It does, but do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> there is that mocking of them that you, oh, you don't go out and about. That that's you kind of live your life digitally, sat down, right? Because there is that possibility. But then you, you do have, and not just elderly, but people maybe who are not as capable of getting out and about. There is a digital solution there to they, they need access to service that you can provide digitally. Why hide it behind really poorly designed stuff when you can make sure it's accessible to um, the elderly or the infirm? It's like a massive deal. It is even just small things like Skype, like communicating with someone who's living, like grandkids who live far away. Um, Makes a difference. It does like make a parents, massive quality of life massive difference. From the, I, I, I think things would have been totally different for my parents if they hadn't been able to see like my nephew, like almost every day. Yeah, I think things would have been totally different. And my mum just gets emotional at the slightest mm -hmm. thing. She's one of them that's at the airport, like jumping around, like screams and runs through and security have to drag her back, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, but going back to your point about accessibility, um, one of the other things that came out in this report, which is quite interesting, there's not, not a lot of detail around um, specifics of this, but um, another thing that came out of the report was that 25% of disabled people have not used the net um, which is a massive what percentage? 25% Blimey. to a quarter of disabled people due to accessibility, those kinds of things. Um, I'm, I'm guessing, but yeah, that is a massive difference. Um, and these are, you know, people that could make massive use of the internet. Like you were saying, like that accessibility. That's issue. a huge share. Yeah. yeah. Quarter of all disabled people. Um, obviously, uh, scope have said that this is a shocking kind of statistic and that things need to be done about it. There's not more information about the reasons behind that, um, why those 25% of disabled people have not had access. That really bears further examination, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. That's a huge number. Yeah. Is, it, is there an age range or a kind of... No, that's it. It literally yeah. just gives you that. Needs more yeah. Yeah. It needs more but, information. I mean, have you seen visually impaired people actually using the web? I mean, I know you could probably think about it and be like, I know how that works. And obviously we all work in, in the web, but actually watching it happen, it's ridiculous. It's yeah. like, is that how you actually navigate the internet? They do not have a screen. Imagine taking your monitor away. We had a doing a, a bit of stand-up talk about um, accessibility in that sense, and it blew him away that they didn't have monitors, because you just don't think, you, you just assume they've got uh, a laptop, um, which they can access uh, and use like the blind feature on it, but they literally don't have a screen. It's like a different thing. It's a, interesting thing for how we design things and how we implement things but uh, in terms of going forward it's you've got to think about things like that do accessibility readers let you choose the voice is it like <laughs> sat <-nums? laughs> that's what the problem is because you have like patrick yeah. stewart reading you the internet <laughs> if they don't that should definitely i, be a thing. I often uh, think about if i could have someone just follow me around and narrate my life but only i could hear them uh, so no one else could see them, Larry David. I, I've toyed with Patrick Stewart for a while, but the thought of Larry David uh, being my internal monologue would be quite interesting. I know we've gone wildly off topic there, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, imagine if you could be a screen, screen reader, Larry David. Just imagine if mad you could be stuff. a screen reader. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Moving on? Yeah, well, there's no real good way of uh, segueing into you this one. You can do it back. So um, it, though, do it. Um, old people, politics. Old people don't vote. Old, old people do vote. They're the only people voting. Uh, so vote, uh, but yeah, because it's around election time again, mm -hmm. there's stuff going on. Uh, we've got two kind of political things next up on the news section. So blue feed, red feed. Um, this is a tool for showing political bias on news feeds. And it's pretty interesting. Yeah, so just to fill you in, um, in 2015, um, there was a research paper published by Facebook scientists Apparently that is now a thing, <laughs> Facebook scientists. It um, really is. And it looks is that as distinct from the evil Facebook scientists? Or? Um, yeah, and also the, the Christian Facebook bit, scientists. The Facebook scientists line of whether even that is a bit blurry. They've done some studies in the <laughs> yeah. past, haven't they? Um, and this looks at how a subset of social networks users reacted to news appearing in their feeds. Essentially, what came out of this was that they could identify um, liberal news stories and conservative news stories um, and what uh, the Wall Street Journal have done is they've created a very nice little tool uh, called the blue feed red feed and you go on this and you select a particular topic and you can see side by side 
news stories about topics like Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, and you can see the type of articles that are being reported and compare how it will appear in someone that Facebook would assume is a liberal person and or assume is a conservative person. And you can see the difference between the, the types of articles that appear there. And it's very interesting. How does it handle things like The Onion and uh, The Daily <laughs> Mash and News? How does it pick up on irony and sarcasm? Well, I mean, it's not 100% yeah. kind of accurate because there was a couple of situations where I saw the same article um, reproduced across both sides. Yeah. Um, there's, there's always going to be some sort of crossover. Yeah. Interestingly, um, when you select Donald Trump on here, I kind of got the sense that both liberal and conservatives hate him. Not equally. There's there's slight like on cons the conservative side, but they were still kind of like, he's a bit of a monster. Because his mother was a jackal and he's literally the Antichrist from where no hope or goodness can come. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Right. This was always the big fear with... Um, Sort of personalized news, personalized content was that you create the self fulfilling echo chamber where you tend to like liberal articles, you get fed more, you tend to exclude other political views, and end up in a little weird cocoon. Um, I, yeah, I don't know, I'm kind of in two minds about this because people tend to do that anyway, so it's a very natural instinct. I suppose the fact it's being fed to you online kind of maybe exacerbates and kind of speeds that up. Um, but then on the other hand, yeah, it, it's a natural tendency for people to listen to ideas that resonate with them, listen to people who have ideas that resonate with them far more than others. I mean, what do we... Do you actually have to opt in to kind of having more provocative content at Facebook? Could there be an option where you actually say, don't just feed me stuff I like, feed me stuff that I kind of... is contrary to that? I love that. Occasionally send me something really weird through my... you know, something opposite to what I normally like. Yeah. Like the exact opposite of my normal bubble. Like just stick it in my feed sometimes that'd be amazing it's I love important that. i love the idea of like a visual representation of bias i think mm. it's great even if it's not flawless um, i think news is like messed up in britain it is like massively so but can you compare that with actually in the united states we're like miles apart from them actually where i know quite close to some people in America who are Democrats and some people I'm quite close to who are Republicans, um, only exposed to one um, sort of media. The, the Democrats that I know only expose the media that is actually in favour of their view. The same with the Republicans. The Republicans I know absolutely lovely human, people, human beings, but believe some absolutely bonkers stuff about healthcare and guns, just like mental. But they're all, they're in a, they are in a bubble exactly like you said, they only see Fox News, it's the only thing that they see. And even if it's just that when they're looking at that, there is this visual representa representation of um, this is very conservative, and they're seeing actually this, this kind of toggle yeah. of bias, I think it's quite helpful. Even if it's not able to show them other viewpoints, the, the, something sparking in the mind, actually this isn't um, the only opinion out there. Yeah. This I think is it's a, quite important. So go on, oh, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm personally very aware of my own bubble. Mm -hmm. And I try my best to like move out of it sometimes and just go and search for that opposite viewpoint, partly to just see what's going on and partly to challenge my own viewpoint. I'm always right, so it's fine. Um, but, but it always surprises me how other people don't realize they're in the bubble. Like I've got so many very clever, intelligent friends who are in the same bubble I'm in and are always really shocked when they think other people think opposite mm, like, yeah. of them. And that's what's dangerous, not knowing that there are loads of other people out there that don't think the same as you and your friends. This is something that goes way beyond Facebook, but it, it's something where Facebook could actually play a massive role. I mean, they've got a very unintentionally hilarious advertising campaign right now, where they've got Facebook, the place for debate, and then they've got a smiley face and an upset face. And it's kind of like, that's what debate is on Facebook. It's something being posted and people reacting to it in one of two binary ways, which is crazy. So maybe Facebook at the moment have the kind of time and capacity and the sort of the autonomy almost to sort of start to do something to mix this up a little bit to maybe take a stand and prevent this this bubble from occurring. I don't. I I think there's been signs with changes that Facebook have made recently where they are basically determined that everyone who is on Facebook is eternally happy. Like anything that has any kind of negative sentiment, unless it's some sort of like passionate outcry, they they they're very much focused on everyone being happy on Facebook. They've, they've tried to remove so much of their 
um, functionality and different things that would indicate that people are ever sad and they they ban content which they you know they claim breaks their rules but then you look at it and it's like well no it's just because if people read it they'd realize the world was a horrible in place filled with injustice but so. then they, they're so picky about it like they only do what they feel like so i've reported plenty of things to facebook because i'm that kind of person um you mainly don't want to keep supporting all of my posts <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, may, I basically just report you johnny yeah. constantly over and over and nothing happens why is it not a super like <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, and I, when i report them i make sure i'm not just reporting them just to be a pain mm. i you go through the process and i don't know if anybody's gone through the process before but you do have to uh, go through loads of like is it this is it that why are you reporting this and it always fits into one of their boxes that's against their community guidelines and they always get back to me and say we don't agree and I'm like no but it, it was awful like I don't just go around reporting anything yeah. I only reported something that was actually awful and you still didn't get rid of it yet you get rid of like ladies nipples all the time and you know that's a whole debate in itself yeah. uh, a separate debate I just wanted to say nipples mm. <laughs> I was waiting for the nipples to come up <laughs> we should do some kind of campaign. Where, where are you <laughs> <laughs> We can do a campaign. Fun, but but you can't, be, you can't be using suggested nipple campaign. That's all I'm saying. I um, really like doing a good doing... campaign about provoke, putting an image on Facebook and saying, "Why would you like to ban this?" Is it because it contains nipples. What else is banned? Bex? Well, there was a good campaign. Something though, or content that I don't believe in. There was a campaign recently. I don't know if it's on Facebook or not. Um, about uh, it was a video about checking your your breasts for lumps and because this it would great. be banned uh off facebook would ban it if it was oh, like, yeah so it's a guy with man boobs and a woman behind him they're showing how to and it wasn't banned uh, really brilliant yeah, yeah. A really, really yeah. point, point well made, I yeah. think, on, on many levels. Mm. Um, there was also a really good campaign on Instagram, because women's nipples also aren't allowed on Instagram, uh, where they got a load of pictures of women naked and cut out the nipples and put men's nipples on top of it. And it looked like the same, yeah. um, but they had done it and what, saw what Instagram would do about it and what dele it deleted them. But, you know, that's a really good point yeah. as well. So more political stuff. Uh, the next one is about uh, the the sharing economy. Please tell us about this. Um, so there was a study done um, again in America. They love their studies over there. They love studying stuff. Um, and basically it was done into the sharing economy. And one of the things that came out of this was that they were surprised by the fact that um, people who were reported as being left leaning were the ones that were kind of um, against any kind of um, regulation for the sharing economy. Now, quite uh, traditionally, regulation is seen as the as as kind of something that left-leaning people would be after, so that it can control the market and you know funnel money into the poor people's hands, which obviously is obscene to anyone who's right-leaning. Um, and they want no regulation so that they can um, let off the shackles of their oppressive socialist masters and do whatever they want so they can raise loads of money. Um, the issue I have with this report is that um, it's not the same. Regulation for, for kind of tech based things digital progression is nothing to do with like these traditional views of kind of regulation as we know it from from um a meritocracy it's to do with kind of big business taking over and having a bigger voice than these small startups who maybe don't have as much money however okay i'm going to move on now because this is actually my i'm going to make this my rant of the month i've got a massive bee in my bonnet about the sharing economy because mainly because it's not sharing most of it isn't sharing so the biggest person you think of biggest organization you think of when you think of the sharing economy is uh, airbnb sharing yeah not sharing what is sharing about about airbnb you money exchanges hands no one's <laughs> yeah. sharing anything and in a lot of cases people have actually gone out and bought an apartment to make money off for airbnb like it's not it's nothing to do with sharing to be fair i went to london ux conference recently which is amazing and i made a mistake of 
Airbnb and not an entire apartment that I shared with someone who was perfectly fine, but we shared many awkward silences, like genuinely shared deep, uncomfortable moments. But as long as you trade them equally, Johnny, that's okay. I, went, I just went up to my room and screamed into a pillow for like 30 or 40 minutes. So there was some degree of sharing, probably not the right sort of sharing. Would that be correct? Surprisingly, actually, following on from that theme, I've shared a lot of really long, awkward silences with Uber taxi drivers. Uber taxi drivers are terrifying. I've had three and three occasions in the dark on the way home. They've commented on my eyes. In the dark, they can't see my. But you've got very bright eyes. In the dark's the best time to see them. Um, well, yeah. But then on the subject of Uber taxi drivers, like they're also terrified. If you kind of get an Uber in London now, they're obscenely polite and like really. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's just my recent experiences. But like they kind of give me water and peppermints and sort of making really forced small talk because there's such competition to get a really good rating. The force and the slightly obsequious kind of form of, I don't know what service you need, which I don't know if this is an intentional consequence or not, but it's starting to kind of make the experience feel more and more uncomfortable to me. And I'd rather have like a fairly irate, angry cabbie, you know, bellowing on at something. In a sense, I'd rather have less control over the, the driver's future than I do now with Uber, because if I start to rate them one star, that becomes a serious economic risk for them. Yeah, it's absolutely horrendous. And this is another problem with the sharing economy. I literally could go on about this all day. There are a lot of problems with the sharing economy and this regulation around it. And this is the regulatory issue. So Uber has different regulations based on whatever city you're in, based on what that city demands Uber regulate for or against. So some cities are fairly all right. Uh, other cities, Uber aren't getting any sort of like, they're not, they're on, you know, it's a zero hour contract. They're not, they're, they're all freelancers. They've not got proper jobs. There's no job security. Uber are refusing to take any responsibility for a lot of stuff. Um, there's, there's just so many issues with it. And this is because they're saying, um, oh, you know, don't, don't regulate Uber because we're confused about what it is because it's technology. It's actually just a platform. It's not a thing, but the amount of regulation that Uber put on the drivers mm actually they should be employing them there's like a, a load of legislation around this it's dead complicated and i've looked into it and even i struggle but it makes loads of sense that you know because uber do have a lot of say over what the drivers do they should be, they're at the point where really they should be employing them um, but yeah all these left-leaning people who are like yeah don't don't regulate this man it's just because they they don't want to lose airbnb and uber because yeah. they enjoy the experience of it and i hate it it really annoys me i mean the, the, there's a lot of um, legal cases happening certainly in America at the moment because where do they love legal cases um, but America and there but th these are really interesting ones it's all to do with the fact that um, both Uber and Airbnb and a lot of the um, quote unquote sharing economy um, startups uh, insist that they only provide a platform and that everyone that uses the platform, including the people providing the service, are absolutely nothing to do with them. And there was a case recently where uh, one judge basically told Uber that that was a load of bullshit. Which it is. Um, and said that they needed to, in some way, enforce um, more regulation with their drivers. Um, not just for the safety of the passengers, but also for the safety of the drivers. It's a, it's a whole thing about for good, right? Where you can, put, you can see quite clearly the, the business logic behind Uber's decisions and the same with Airbnb, Uber, massive transportation company, doesn't own a single cab, right? Very few overheads in that regard and the less rights that they give their workers, the financial, they're financially better off, they have less risk in some ways. Um, so it's, from a purely business perspective, it makes very little sense for them, right? But the whole point is be a human being. Yeah, I mean, th this is the thing, a business will instinctively fight these things because legally they have an obligation to. You, you can have an obligation to try and generate the most value for your shareholders, so you will always answer in the way which will do that. I, maybe it's less a question of regulating Uber and regulating the relationship between Uber and its drivers. That's kind of what needs regulating. So not the platform, not the technology, not the concepts, but the relationship between the platform and the people who it effectively employs or at least engages with to deliver its service. Yeah, well, this is, this is the third problem with it. Um, is that, uh, thank you Ben for being very good at leading into my points, uh, the, the, um, I, I go on about how I think these things should be regulated, but actually if you allow governments to regulate this kind of stuff as it is, they're not very good at it because they, they just 
not very good at regulating technology and, and they're not very progressive with thinking about what, what this really means. And they tend to just put in really rubbish laws that don't make any sense or help anybody and they rush it and they don't really think it through or understand it. So, so yeah, the laws that, or regulations that have to come out of this are incredibly going to be incredibly new and, and complicated and should be because it's a new platform. It's something that we haven't seen before. I mean, what's interesting is... Wait, wait. I suppose it depends in what kind of regulation you're talking about. So like I was saying before, like this belief that just because they're left-leaning that they should believe in um, regulation. But it depends. I mean, if you're talking about minimum wage, overtime pay, um, health insurance, compensation, then I think most left-leaning people would be like, yes, those are the kinds of things we want for our workers. But then it's like, what does that come bundled with? So is it, you know, are there other kind of levies and taxes and things in there that basically mean that they're hobbled and they can't fight against them because the big companies have had a whisper in their, the ear of their friends who are making the laws and said, oh, you should definitely, like, increase taxation on this or you should give them this kind of, like, really, I mean, make force them to do some sort of training in this aspect and then, you know, it completely makes that... Yeah, um, business wanna, model default. Exactly. You don't want to complicate processes for startups and stop this innovation happening. It's got to really take that into account. Um, but I, another thing that annoys me is that, you know, these left-leaning people are also being swayed because they don't know any of this is happening. And they're being swayed by the whole concept of the sharing economy is a lovely thing. It sounds lovely, doesn't it? Sharing economy. Nothing could be going wrong with the sharing economy because uh, it's all lovely. And actually, there are lovely things happening in the sharing economy. There are a lot of uh, community-based share literally sharing like you'd say i've got a i need i need some gardening equipment because i've not like bought it like i just need to do my garden so and then somebody else will say yeah you can lend my lawnmower for a weekend there's a lot of that about and that's genuine sharing there's no money crossing hands there's no contracts it's all just genuinely peer-to-peer -peer good stuff that is actually sharing um but you know people like airbnb it's not they're not doing cool stuff and uber not doing cool stuff but they're lording around as the sharing economy anyway. So could we have like a, a sharing economy charter where to be part of the sharing economy there has to be a balance between the central platform and the users in terms of profits, obligations, what else? Risk, I don't know, something where it genuinely is sharing that across the community rather than just facilitating and skimming money off the top rather than being like a management agency yeah, essentially. like a rating. If only there was some kind of way to rate things with five stars. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe fewer, should you think the service was worth less? Well, God damn it. You know, also, you talk about tech for good. Like, again, this is a whole debate we need to have another time. What actually is good? What does good mean? Um, but there's some really horrible things going on in the sharing economy. There was a thing called monkey parking that ar Sorry, arose. Sorry, again. Monkey parking. We've talked about dogs taking contact with yeah. humans. <laughs> I'm excited about the potential for this, but I, I believe I'm going to be upset. This is nothing to do with monkeys. God damn it. I'm um, out. I'm but out. what they decided to do, um, it's changed now. So if you look them up, it doesn't exist. It's actually something quite nice now no, uh, because they got a lot of a lot of slate in for what they did. But what they said was, right, really, really busy city areas. Anyone who has a car will know it's really, really hard to find on-street parking. So what you could do, you could park, take ages, find your parking space, and then go on monkey parking and uh, put your spot up for auction. So okay. who, the highest bidder, so you just sit in your car and wait for the highest bidder and you'd sell <laughs> on your, your parking spot yeah. um, to somebody else. Like just on street, on street parking. Yeah. eBay for parking. They, there was another one for uh, reservations in restaurants as well. So if it, there was a restaurant that was completely sold out, you could. it was almost like you know buying loads of tickets to a concert and then selling them off. Taking the concert prices. the ticket town to the masses. Yeah, so it's not, but it's not to the masses, and Everyone loves is tickets out. All of this is just making rich people have All a better life. All of these people should die in a fire. Making rich this people richer and having a better life um, so people that make like would make a hotel reservation uh, a restaurant reservation and sit there like an ass and sell the the spot that's what you're talking about I, you probably want to sell a spot before because if you have to sit at the restaurant it's maybe yeah, getting no, you, a bit late with restaurants restaurants are slightly different you just make a load of reservations and say i've made a load of reservations so you won't be able to make one but you can buy my reservations is it illegal to push these people into traffic Found well, Johnny, this is the classic risk reward ratio that our whole financial uh, city of London is based on. So. A jury of my peers wouldn't convict me for that. Like, just, why would people do this? Well, really well they, it's they, awful. TechCrunch actually coined these uh, kind of things, jerk tech, which I quite like. Yes. I'm going with that. Can we do a, a jerk tech podcast as well? <laughs> or just out people? 
this is pretty much on the same level of that that app I think that was doing the rounds in China I think where you could um, buy a hitman um, <laughs> <laughs> it's well, like, that's actually illegal though, right? it made me very little money well <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm pretty sure it was the weird thing about that was when you said that you were instinctively like tapping something yeah. on your fake mobile phone <laughs> just it's sense memory you know I've ordered a lot of hits so yeah that was a real product you could that was an actual thing hitman yeah I mean it's convenient well, like, if we talk about accessibility there might be someone who's elderly you can't get out and about to meet <laughs> hitmen in a traditional way or to make the hit themselves yeah so te- is that still tech for good I mean it depends who they're hitting it depends who you it depends who you kill it true actually yeah. it's certainly empowering I think we can all agree on that this took a turn very quickly yeah. down that road I mean this is from the country where they gamified being a good citizen the horrible part is when I read the the article about that gamification of being a good citizen I actually wanted to get involved just so I could get like those brownie points those fascinating precious that points oh, yeah. whereas that, that ironically that via you know being like the lad by but we've gamified being a bad citizen so yes <laughs> On that note, we are out of time. Does anybody have any burning thoughts they want to share before we round up? Uh, I'd just like to thank um, our little uh, beer monkey, Ian, for collecting. <laughs> Say hello, Ian. No one's heard your voice. Say hello loudly and clearly into Paul's mic. Go on. No. He's <laughs> <laughs> uh, such Ian. a strong, confident <laughs> man. I want to be completely clear there's no irony in us uh, damning the whole concept of parking monkeys, then having a beer monkey. Then that's, there's nothing, there's no, <laughs> no connection no. there. No. Don't no. draw that. I just really want to go meet one of these dogs that I can pay your contact list. I don't care what I'm paying for. Uh, it could be like to fund a diamond mine with children uh, I, if there's a dog and I can do contactless payment so later on when we're all chasing around town with our cars trying to pet dogs <laughs> just chasing dogs. dogs if you <laughs> see that and a dog owner is like get away from my dog what are you doing is it not one of those dogs just That's listen to the podcast yeah. <laughs> well thanks for listening uh, maybe next month we'll get in a guest and we'll be brave enough to do that because we know what we're doing now uh, what a treat um, to, for a guest to come in and actually speak on our podcast. Um, if you want to send us complaints, uh, Twitter is at techforgoodmcr. Uh, thank you for listening. Bye. Goodbye. Take care.